Antoine Maxwell. We're both from Chicago, representing Peace Hand Chicago. I'm also representing the AIDS Foundation of Chicago, and Antoine is representing t -Pan. So getting to zero, engaging the South Side of Chicago through community mobilization. Okay. So this is just a, um, a chart of the, the demographic profile of Chicago. So 32% of Chicago's population is African American. About 31 is white, not Hispanic. 28 um, Hispanic. Um, you know, 5% Asian. So this is um, the 2010 HIV Continuum of Care. Um, so there was an expected 23,000 people living with HIV, um, those that know and don't know. And of those, 19,000 people were diagnosed as living with HIV. Um, only 51% of the total population um, was retained in care, and only 10,000 people, 46% of the, that population, um, is prescribed art, and um, only 45% of the total population is um, Martin Luther Brooks. So in Chicago, um, the Chicago Department of Public Health and all the organizations are looking at how can we increase um, viral suppression, um, but it takes um, engagement from every front, um, from testing, um, diagnosis, and linkage to care, retention to care, and um, the like. Since Chicago is a large community area with a lot of different communities, with, um, with a lot of different people, um, we want to focus on a specific neighborhood. Um, so we selected um, the South Shore community. Um, South Shore, got me on there. Um, it's right along the lake, and um, it's primarily African American. Um, and it's gone through a lot of change over the last few years. Um, the, last, the last 10 years or so have been um, challenging as um, Businesses are closed, and we're really looking at revitalizing the community. Um, in the South Shore, about 17% of the people there are unemployed, um, and the income is um, there's a there's a variation in income. Um, the median income in South Shore is $27,000, which is $15,000 less than the citywide median of $46,000. Um, another interesting thing about South Shore is that it has a large African American um, gay population, um, oftentimes is called the, um, the Black Boys Town. Um, so that's why we um, chose that community area. And just like many communities on the South Side of Chicago, um, there's also a lot of fear of um, crime and violence. So the South Side, South Shore, is, um, crime and, and violence can impact people's engagement in medical care and services. And we want to talk about where medical care is in a few slides. Um, so looking at the HIV prevalence in South Shore specifically, um, as of 2011, there were uh, 595 um, persons living with HIV in South Shore. And also, aside from those living with HIV, um, there's also high rates of STIs in that community area. Um, and there were over 917 cases of reported chlamydia in 2011, um, and 360 recorded cases of gonorrhea, just in that small community area that I showed you a few moments ago. Also, um, primary and secondary syphilis is up. There were um, 34 reported cases. This is um, a snapshot taken from the Chicago Tribune a couple weeks ago, and it was really um, to speak into the increase, um, the increase of um, black males, um, being found living with HIV, especially younger populations. If you look at this pie chart, pie chart here, I'm going to know this um, a little bit later on another slide, but this is the incidence of white males, this is Latino males, and African American males. So this is all the way up there, so it's um, hugely disproportionate in the city. Now, um, we don't know the rhyme or reason to this. It could just be expanded testing um, of this targeted population, especially with a lot of grant funding being for communities of color. So this could be a good thing, but the bottom line is that with so many cases that we need to tailor programs and services for this community. Um, so again, we want to focus on African American YMSM. Um, one thing I'd say about, about Chicago um, is um, there's been a lot of work done around HIV um, um, reduction, treatment, and care. Um, over the last few years, there's been a decrease in females across the board. It's been a decrease in African-American females. 
there's also been a decrease in um, intervening drug users. But the group that is still steadily increasing is young MSM in Chicago, especially young black MSM. So this is um, a trick. This is um, an incidence map um, for Chicago, um, for, just for MSM, for black MSM. And um, if you look at the map, the population is skyrocketing is um, the 20 to 29 age group. There, the um, green lines with the um, triangles. Also, another group that is spiking is the 13 and 19 population. Like in 2000, there were maybe 20, 25 cases, and they're steadily rising. So, looking at the gaps in services when we did our needs assessment, this is um, a poll that we found in um, another community needs and an LGBT focused needs assessment that was done in 2011. And it's really talking to um, just the difference in services. So a lot of the services in Chicago are located on the north side of Chicago. Um, and then there are some sprinkled in on the south side, out on the south side, but there could be more um, services provided and offered in the communities that people live so people won't have to travel far to get patient care or testing. Um, one interesting thing about Chicago is that if you're on the north side of Chicago, at random you can probably find 10, 15, 20 organizations offering HIV tests. And it's not the same on the south and west sides of Chicago. Um, also, other services that are needed, so um, HIV testing, treatment, care, um, prep clinics, um, just conversations that are being had about um, what the advances are in prevention, um, access to condoms. Though Chicago does a wonderful job with distributing condoms across the city, there are still other ways that we can um, meet the community where they are. Okay. So I'm just cover a little bit of our B10. So B10 is a national network, and really we're looking at creating change in our local communities. And one way we want to do that is through um, really training the community and um, health literacy as it pertains to HIV care and treatment. Um, we want to engage our local health department. So our, in Chicago, we have the Chicago Department of Public Health, but also we have the Illinois Health Department down in Springfield that, is, um, that we're looking to engage, that we're engaging with and looking to foster um, a continued, um, foster a stronger relationship. Also, we want to ensure that African Americans are engaged in research, clinical trials, and ensure that we are creating programs for us that um, speak to our communities and for our communities. And here is just a map of um, the B10 networks across the United States of America, and Kingston, Jamaica is, um, is covered there by the screen. But we have about 28 partners at this point. And then, again, these are four project areas that we're looking to um, create programs for. So treatment, education, patient navigation, disclosure, and advocacy. And here is the general B10 um, logic model. So we have a lot of programs and activities tied to those four components that I just mentioned. But overall, we're looking at increasing viral suppression, decreasing viral loads in our communities, and increasing participation in clinical trials. <laughs> so, <clears throat> when looking at trying to take a national initiative and trying to really start synthesizing local change, Chicago has already had a BTAM before, but we have some barriers. Okay? And so, with those barriers, when we talk about advancing BTAM, we really start seeing, trying to figure out ways. If zero is really the goal, then mobilization is the only way that we can get there. One of the quotes by Phil Wilson also says, you know, that we're now at the time where we have all the tools we needed to start ending the HIV epidemic. So when we talk about B10 Chicago, we're really transparent about just some of our history, but also some of the great successes. B10 Chicago also uh, facilitated some of the IIS, International AIDS um, Conference that was here in D.C. two years ago, I believe. Uh, BTAN Chicago actually facilitated some really intense community post-hub workshops that lasted like three or three days for one. Um, we also had programs in place 
previously called the Ashe Project. The Ashe Project was an initiative that we created that looked at nothing but working with youth to create peer led, I mean, peer educators that could create those peer led initiatives that even like Ms. Lindsay talked about earlier are essential when you're trying to get youth to one be engaged, but also for them to be involved in investing in their own care. Um, one of the things we did this year that was really interesting is that we got the opportunity to work with the Masonic Lodges. We got the opportunity to work with some of the Eastern Stars and also some of the fraternities. But it was really a unique experience because what we find out is that when we come out of the bubble of social service, the rest of the community just doesn't know. They just don't know. Um, uh, the question that was offered, specifically when we talk about why, um, what over the last year, me and Alan both, now that we've relaunched um, B10 Chicago, the one of the things that has helped um, B10 become a little bit more stabilized is the new structure that BAI supplied that said, hey, we're going to provide you guys a little bit more technical assistance. It also um, responses on how to handle some of the situations. And so that's been really essential for us to kind of just stay focused, but also to kind of keep, um, just navigate <laughs> the systems that we've been working with a little bit wiser. Um, and like I said, this new structure has helped us provide some stability, um, increase the reputability of BTAN Chicago. Because when people say BTAN, people are like, well, what's that? And you say Black AIDS Institute, they say, oh, I know them. So, you know, we try to make sure we make sure the branding is, has some continuity. <clears throat> so, when we talk about engaging our traditional Black Institutes, it became this list of people who've always done the work, but they don't look like them. And so in Chicago, we don't have a lot of black CBOs. And so with that, there have been all these institutes like TPAN, where I work currently, which was historically a white gay initiative, white gay peer-led company. Um, these institute, institutes have been given dollars to work with communities. And what we find out, um, Alan, probably we've heard it so many times, that these uh, historically uh, white agencies are having barriers in accessing African Americans. That they have grants for testing and can't get the scopes. And we say, you can? How is that possible? You know. So we try to find a way to really start making B10 a capacity building of all four service providers. We're going to help you get to where you are, but we're also going to teach you how to do it. So um, we got the opportunity to work with Care to Prevent, which is University of Chicago, um, which is one of our B10 uh, co chair Ebony Turk is a, that works for the University of Chicago. So for our B10 training, they provided us free space at the University of Chicago, which is Ivy League school. You know, they make, they, the space itself, when we did the budget for it, it was like $3,000 a day, and they gave it to us for three days for free. So, thank you, University of Chicago. <laughs> and Illinois Department of Public Health is one of the Chicago Department of Public Health. This, this is, just typed out the list of people that were on there. So our B10 training. Um, after the initial 30-day um, training, me, Alan, and our colleague Kendra were challenged to go out into our network and do a one-day training. That one-day training was implemented in two ways. First we did, uh, we did, we engaged 38 students at Harold Washington College, which is a community college in Chicago, one of the seven community colleges in the Chicago Community College system. Um, we got an opportunity to do uh, three day, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday courses. The teachers had surrendered them to us, um, and we did a sociology and anthropology course, and we just talked about the origins of HIV. So I took out content that was from some of the modules that we went through in the um, Science and Treatment College, and just found them for those courses, they were perfect. Because then we're talking about ethics, we're talking about com cultural competency. And so for our anthropology course, it was really rich. Um, so we also engaged them, and actually um, I had some assistance from Rebecca. Actually, she helped me to create a post-test, uh, pre- and post-test survey just around some of the content. <coughs> and we also did the intro to, intro to major and future HIV basic science research. Um, our goal with that was to make it a, sti a stigma reduction initiative. Every time we ask this question about the origins of HIV, we find people want to get stuck there. Because stigma is real. The beliefs are real about where HIV came from. And then the response of low perception of risk um, is real because people don't feel like they're at risk because they think it's a lie. They think it's not real. Um, and we watch it. So we engage there and we end it here. And so we'll talk a little bit later about the pre and post test and our results from that. And like I said, the training was implemented over two weeks, um, 
the first week I was in the sociology course, and the second week the anthropology course. And I do the Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, two hours a day. <laughs> uh, Alan got the opportunity to do to train 11 staff and participants from the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. Um, they consider case manager, prevention managers, testing individuals. Anyone else on this? And the miracle of The miracle of volunteers. Um, and he talked about some of the HIV basic science research, uh, intro, major, and future goals of HIV basic science, which it was a brown bag launching. Um, training was requested. One of the feedbacks that came from them, like, we need to do this more often because there was an apparent learning curve when they all discussed, <laughs> I didn't know this. Here are our case managers. Here are our testing people all saying, I didn't know. Um, so we thought that was really interesting. What do you want to say about that? So here's the pre and post test response from results from both of those settings. So here in Harold Washington, everybody start from the beginning. They were like, yeah, you know, 30, 13, 30%, 32%. Um, and AFC, these are the clinicians, not being too much higher, 43%. And then after the P and pre and post test, I mean, after the post test, uh, we, walked, we saw this jump specifically with here in Washington of like almost 60%. Just around being able to, just to now answer questions around HIV origin and just being able to now put a name to what we call HIV in the black community. It was really rich. And then here at AFC, we also saw a huge jump. And for AFC, it probably was more like a refresher because we don't talk about it that often. So, and also primarily the group that we worked with, that I worked with were um, AmeriCorps volunteers. So they um, were part of a year long program. So they were working in different organizations, but they may not have known a lot about basic, basic science. So. So then we had it in February, our three-day training. Okay, so it went from one day to three days, and I think we were all a little paranoid at that point in time because it was a huge demand to ask agencies and individuals to commit to come to three days of HIV training. Um, 22 participants showed up, 12 service providers, and 10 community members. Uh, the VTS Chicago members also uh, provided everything was paid for by different sponsors that. Um, the BTAM members actually just reached out to us. So we had some pharmaceutical companies donate, um, our host agency at the time donated, and also just um, we, BTAM Chicago supply all the food. So that was really good because we knew food was going to be a non negotiable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we were going to keep these people here for six hours every day. Um, one, of the Sorry. one of the success and challenges from that one, um, and we probably can piggyback off of this, what we thought were successes. Um, we were really shocked at one of the turnout. We didn't think we were going to get that much turnout. Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges for us was really maintaining some sense of flexibility. So when you're working with clinicians and doctors, and they say, okay, I'll come at 11.30, and then they call you at 11.35 and say, oh, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> or something came up. Uh, someone just went into labor. We found us having to be really innovative about like, so we're going to slide into this. Because it's like the more planning you put into it, it's like that's when things can kind of go a little array. <laughs> Uh, so we really learned to be a little bit more flexible and at the same time still be innovative. Uh, and then just a couple um, additional successes and challenges from that. Um, our event happened like right after a big um, cold spell, like it was like 20 of those girl for like two or three weeks. So here's the agenda actually from that day. So it was really loaded um, with all the activities that we went through, the topics we covered for each day. This is specifically day one. We did a couple. Um, we found a video that was on YouTube that talked about the origin of HIV. It was really similar to the module that we went through. So we showed that video. Um, and then we had discussion groups around it. Um, we also did a really cool, um, oh, we used the Jeopardy game. So we had another pre and post test on this, our evaluation tool involved in. We used the Jeopardy game. We augmented it just a little so that way it reflected the, con the conversation we were having for that day. And like, I would say earlier, Alicia came. She came in a little skinny uh, windbreaker, and we were like, <laughs> She's I just brought in the airport. We were like, and then she left it in the airport all the way back. Like, yeah, because that was not a real jacket, not for Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't even support furs, but like, Chicago's a place that's making me think about getting a fur. So this was day one. It was a really loaded day. It started at 9.30 and ended at like 3.45. Um, day two, 
we did reflections and agenda. So we kind of went back and just kind of process, had a lot of open conversations. And then we did a presentation on HIV testing, first generation to now. So we incorporated every type of HIV test I could get, we could get our hands on. So we did the Oracle, we did the Clearview, we did the ISTE, and we showed how they all work. And said, so how do we prepare service providers to provide results in 60 seconds? Specifically in states that are looking at doing test to test, I'm um, sorry, rapid, rapid algorithms in the field of HIV testing. So we showed them how it looked, and it was blowing people away that it was a 60 second test. Uh, and say, are we prepared for that? Because I don't know how it is here in California, but we did used to do like, you know, intense counseling training on how to provide results for the Oroquig and just in the field period. But no one came out with it like, okay, well, you know, it's like a 10 minute test now. No one started adapting to start preparing clinicians to be able to provide results quicker. So that was a really rich conversation. <clears throat> and then we, we, we talked about prep um, and treatment as prevention like three times over these three days. So we had like intense conversation and that's why I think it was, we saw that people were, they kept hearing it and kept hearing it presented in a different way. <clears throat> Day three, uh, we had a couple of doctors come out. Um, uh, Sybil Hobachek, Jose, um, she sent Chris Belsar, which is her program um, director for a CFAR project that actually she does. It does the prep study. I'm not sure which APPN it is, but it's the one that um, looked at doing for MSM prep. And yes, now, that's what it is. And now they're, they're the one that's also doing the prep study for youth between 13 and 17. So they're giving prep to youth between the ages of 13 and 17, also providing a you know, I want an evidence-based intervention called 3 mv um, to kind of cover the psychosocial factors. So he came, he presented on that, which people were a little caught off guard that here was this research study coming out that was giving a prep to minors and adolescents. And so it was a really rich conversation to hear that. Um, and then we talked about, we did a couple conversations around the syndemics of HIV and then some of the future directions of HIV. So, here are your post-conference um, pre and post-test results. So the word this, uh, these are broken down is that the ISP is service providers and community members. So we split the data a little bit more. So we want to see what was the learning um, growth specifically for service providers and specifically for community members. So um, service providers started off like in the 60s. No one was over 80%. When we talked about specifically around, it's supposed to be down at the body, uh, bottom. The different colors represent uh, different content areas. So the dark purple represented treatment. Um, the greenish color kind of looks like biomedical interventions, and this color represents HIV science. Okay. So the service provider scored higher just over some of the immediate conversations. Right. So when we talked about treatment, biomedical interventions, and HIV science, the community members were like below 30%, all of them. So the post-survey results show that even though I think only two people on the actual test got 100 who were, who were service providers. So even the service provider, they got closer to 100. They were like 98% was the average, I believe. And the community members were right behind them. They were right behind you. And I only think all of with the treatment part, everybody got stuck on the HIV life cycle, <laughs> just like we did in the actual training. So uh, the community members, that was the only thing that they consistently kind of got wrong on the test was just that part. But they were neck and neck, literally, about being able to answer and also relate to information around biomedical intervention, as well as HIV science, which I thought was really awesome. Um, just to kind of support this, um, I believe yesterday I was on the phone with Alec. I was on the bus and I, the lady asked me, well, where are you going? Cause I have my bag and she's like, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to LA. She said, where are you going to LA for? I said, I'm going to school for it. I'm in this internship fellowship program. And I told her what it was. And before I knew it, she said, well, what are they talking about in the fellowship? <laughs> so I said, oh. You did a class. <laughs> so I said, oh, I said, okay, well, this is what it's about. And I started talking about it. So it's about biomedical science and virology. And from, just going to all these words, she said, well, break it down for me. And then when she said break it down, everybody heard her say it. And so we started talking about 
content. So let's talk about prep. Let's talk about treatment as prevention. And it became like a 15 minute conversation with like eight people on the bus and people were clapping. They were like, I didn't know about prep. I didn't know that it was a win. You know, it was really amazing. I was telling you, I said, they don't know. When you really deal with the community, they don't know. They have no idea. They, they're just trying to, they have so many other competing priorities. Anyway. Right. But to hear, there's one more like, child can go on home right now, can go on Give Me That website, and I'm going to go get me some medication tomorrow because she found out it was an option. And I thought it was so empowering just to have a space where we can have those kind of conversations. But then I thought, if I had hosted an event, it would yeah. none of these people would have came. Yeah, that's true. So then, how do I? How do we effectively meet them where they are? Just like you did. And so that's it. Started making me really rethink our outreach initiatives. Sometimes it's about being present. And sometimes it's about being warm enough to open up and have conversations with people like their people and then interject what we, what we have to offer. You know, to remember that they have some dignity about it. We're not just trying to give you pills and medication. So the BJ Project Plan. Um, one of our problems then is that Chicago currently, as Alex said earlier, we're seeing a decrease in HIV and STI infections across the board, except for among youth and MSA, which is problematic. Um, so our goal is to one, look at training youth peer educators who can advocate and assist in creating programs that really work to reduce those barriers, specifically for youth. Um, and also, Alan talked about a little earlier, that here's this map of Chicago's HIV and AIDS case rates. So here's the north side of Chicago, here's the south side of Chicago, right? The little yellow dots represent clinics represent testing sites, they represent places someone can go to access any type of care. So the north side of Chicago, so this has right super. And then you get right here. And it's one, two, three, four, five, six. And I think two of them closed. And it's one ER. And then you, if I layer this with the gun violence map, if I layer it with the poverty map, this area would always be the negligent area or always the one that has the highest burden. So that also speaks to one of our B10 initiatives about advocacy is around creating policies to end medical deserts. Because it's part of our health. It's not just HIV anymore that we have to approach it holistically. Um, so. Public health. Public health. All of it. People health. <laughs> so one of our programs, the arch overarching um, goal of B10 is that we just use the ASHE project, which encompasses the, project, the four B10 project here. Um, so we use that to cover treatment, education, patient navigation, disclosure, and advocacy. And we say Ashe because Ashe is an African colloquialism. It is so. It is so, right? It is so, right? Or amen. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, and so what the goals of the uh, Ashe program is that we use youth to create peer educators, but also we provide them with other options. So um, there's a study that just came out that there's a lady in Chicago doing meditation to youth who are victims of gun violence and yoga. Mm -hmm. So in the Ashe program, last year we started doing yoga and meditation so that youth can have a space where their minds are always mm -hmm. being bombarded right. with stress and triggers. And also we try to connect them with members of B10 Chicago who are service providers who do mentoring. Right. So in the treatment education arm of the Ashe project, and say increasing the health literacies of communities of color around treatment as prevention, biomedical intervention, the Affordable Care Act, and reducing barriers of stigma and distrust in the medical, in the black community. One of the presentations that we did that we maintain, we try to do it as much as we can, we go out to the community, we did a whole presentation around the Tuskegee experiment, and we also did something from a book called The Medical Apartheid, Washington. <laughs> and we also have a presentation around here in a lot. So we put these three three conversations together and created a stigma dialogue around medical distrust for communities of color. And every time we do it, it's always like, oh, this is why we weren't supposed to go here. This is why my grandma said you can't trust white people. This is why they said you can't go let them people shoot you and stuff. This is why. And how those beliefs are still polluting and permanent permeating into our community in some way. So we call it Ashe Ed, right? Um, and it's a youth outreach initiative, as well as we use those things to start partnering with local CFAR and the health department to let them know you can't just have this model of if you build it, they will come. It doesn't work. <coughs> um, and also hosting some Affordable Care Act 
town hall meetings for underinsured and uninsured Chicagoans. Um, in the patient navigation arm, one of our scopes um, is that we do collaborate and do some HIV testing, um, as well as doing some testing knowledge. When we did the step up, get tested for uh, National HIV Testing Day, one of the biggest things that I heard, I tested like 25 black males. 10 of them all said, so you're going to tell me I'm good. You're going to tell me I'm clean, and I wouldn't say, you're good. You're clean. When the results came up, because my, in my mind, I, we need to find a way to give you the tools to say this, to put a name to HIV. Because what we've done, we have a palatable conversation. Like, so you clean? You all right? You ain't got nothing. Instead of asking the questions and being able to say, I'm HIV negative. And so we try to incorporate those parts into our treatment education. It's about building the capacity of people to want to be able to linguistically say what they're experiencing. Um, also to work alongside HIV positive clinics um, here in Chicago, one of the things that we want with our youth education program is that Lurie Children's Hospital has a perinatal um, in the youth program that's for youth that were born with HIV or infected really young. And so they're having some real barriers with treatment fatigue. So we said, hey, well, why don't we use our youth to become like buddies to see if they can help motivate one another to stay in treatment. Now, these are youth that have been in treatment now for, let's say, 14 years, and they're only 14. And they're experiencing treatment fatigue and opting out on taking meds anymore because they say, I'm tired. So we hope that we can utilize that. And also would work to coordinate linkages for YMSM in 18 to, 20, 18 to 29 to those PrEP and PEP clinics. Chicago has three that's opening up in the next year. But of course, the people that need to know don't know. And so you, know, you always wonder sometimes like, how some people get those MOUs for those grants because we're like, didn't you know you have to have us? That's what we want people to start knowing. You have to have us in the conversation. And in the disclosure um, arm, we did a video um, last year called Do You See HIV, which was this stigma initiative that just talked about acting. It was uh, the people who were in the video were only youth who had participated in the Ashe project. So it was them doing all, they wrote the script, they did all the editing themselves. <clears throat> and we just let them do what they wanted to do. And they came up with the concept and we just helped them polish this up. And so we're looking to expand that to really start um, doing conversations around serial status disclosure. One of the things that we always find to be difficult and interesting is that people are just as uncomfortable about saying I'm HIV negative as they are sometimes about saying I'm HIV positive. Just saying HIV period causes stress, having to bring it up. So how do we normalize the dialogue that really we both are sitting here like, I don't know what you know, so I'm saying I'm negative, but I don't know. And I don't know how to say it. I've never been tested. So we're looking at ways to try to like have some skits that you can like put on YouTube or something of them just trying to show the exchange of how do you really say this? And if you're positive or negative. Um, and also in our advocacy arm, looking to use some of the data that we get from our youth about from their focus groups with their peers to create some youth needs assessments to start reporting it out. We feel like we have enough youth, we have enough information, then we should be writing the narrative. We should be writing our own data. We should be able to polish stuff and present to funders. This is what we're experiencing. So we're hoping that we can use the data for that. And also, um, the youth that participate in our shape program also go to Lobby Day, which is this huge um, HIV, uh, which is, is every kind of lobbying for every kind of initiative. Um, but we try to lobby specifically for HIV funding, and they get to see the <laughs> People ignore us <laughs> and us fight for attention and then finally get one person to listen and then just hopefully that person cares. So hopefully there'll be a little experience. And we can also work for doing a youth speakers bureau um, so that they can go into their local high schools. What we found is that sometimes schools have these weird rules that you can't come in, but if they're there, they're getting, they get all the opportunity. So how do we prepare them to access and navigate that sphere? Um, is important. And then the patient navigation are. I think they just double slide it. <laughs> All right. Okay, so now I'm talking about monitoring and evaluation. Um, with treatment education, we're looking at um, creating um, interview, doing interviews of people that are involved in the SHA program, and also conducting surveys for the people involved. Um, looking at disclosure, um, we want that will also be um, collected through interview. Um, 
patient navigation. Um, so people, so we're gonna look at clients that we engage in linkage to care to see how, like, what their barriers to linkage to care are and what would assist them in engaging medical care. Also, we want to um, collaborate with um, different medical homes that we're already tied to in Chicago um, to create um, one better mechanisms for linkage to care, but also ensure that we have um, that ensure that we have MOUs and processes available so that it can be easy to route people that we encounter in the community on the bus or whoever that may be to medical care and services. And then um, as far as evaluating the advocacy, that would be um, people that participate in lobby days or um, the programs and events. And we will also look at um, interviewing and serving. Um, so successes and challenges for the um, fellowship process. Um, uh, one main success um, was really like our expanded um, HIV science and treatment knowledge, just being here for that 30 day experience of sitting through the wonderful classes was awesome. Um, I felt like I learned a lot. I felt that like my, my geek class would fly for 30 days and it was awesome. Um, really to have the one-on-one -on -one direct um, contact with the faculty and staff, um, both BAI and UCLA was invaluable. Um, also, the um, Alu Fellows, I, we had an opportunity to be here with an amazing group of people. We got to laugh, joke, fight, argue, cry, and something else. <laughs> it was like a reality show. It was. <laughs> but, um, but at the end of it, like we all loved one another, and we had the opportunity uh, for community building. I think it's awesome to see that we have all these people to reach out to. If we're away for a conference or work on a project, I know that I can reach out to other people and they will have my back. Um, and then also support from my host organizations, um, from my work for AFC that allowed me to be here for a month and then all the subsequent times and then now that Antoine is at TPAN, I have support for his organization to be here. I think it's um, valuable. Um, real challenges for me was um, time commitment and time management. Being doubly committed and involved in million and one things, like making time for this, but also for the deliverables that weren't always turned in on time. <laughs> um, also, competing in priorities to speak to um, the before, and then funding needs. So we have a lot of great programs um, and things that we like to do, but we have um, funding constraints across the board and also staffing needs. I mean, they're only um, 24 hours in a day. So how to best utilize that and also engage more people um, has been something that's been valuable um, that I've learned over the time. But summing it up, this has been an awesome experience, and um, I'll do conclusions. Um, just, just like, um, really, I'm um, just again thanking um, Black AIDS Institute, um, AIDS Foundation of Chicago, T Pan, Chicago Black Gay Men's Caucus, and a lot of other groups that have supported us has been awesome. Okay. And also, one of the things that we um, specifically our next steps um, is looked at. We're aiming to really solidify the relationship of BTN Chicago with BTN members. And what we find out is just because you have applications in does not mean they're members. Um, that, it's a that, that we all share in this responsibility. But what happens, and what we think um, happens is that because we're the service providers, we haven't effectively brought up those community members for them to start being able to uh, co-chair BTN, for them to be able to effectively do a presentation without us. Um, so we're looking at one, even being to enrich the skills of DTAN members. Like, you know, one of the things that we learned, I think, at Olive Fellow, um, in the, our first fellowship here, that um, you don't even know somebody's background. You know, we have the opportunity to work with a DTAN member who just got a GED, who had never done a paper before. And here we are asking her, you know, this person to do, I need you to do a 30 page PowerPoint. They had no, concept of it, you know. So we've been really trying to find ways to enrich our whole network and our members so that we can start really like um, being able to collaborate a little bit differently. Um, and just in conclusion, I guess, um, today's, um, I, my, I was on a plane yesterday and, and my cap from my tooth came off <laughs> in my gum, so I'm actually in a lot of pain right now. So, but it's been really a rich experience, I think, that Alan and me both. We, we have had pre meetings and we've had a lot of um, outside conversation just around why we're in this uh, fellowship. 
and it's been really enriching. So thank you all, and we're done.